So how many of you have kids? Pop your hands up. That looks like probably about half of you at least. And how many of you have kids that like to make or invent things? Again, probably around half of you. Well, my name's Sean Brown, and I was one of those inventive kids. I'm an engineer, designer, and maker of things. And I've worked on lots of creative engineering projects, from designing my own energy products to helping bring to life the Man Engine, the UK's largest mechanical puppet. I also co-present a YouTube channel called Kids Invent Stuff, where every month we set a different invention challenge, and we invite primary school kids to send us their ideas for inventions, and we're always inundated with loads of brilliant, amazing, creative kids' ideas. And each month, we pick one invention idea that we build and test on camera to show the creative, exciting nature of engineering. Here's a little taste of some of the things we've made. So eight-year-old Radin sent us his idea for a fire and water shooting piano. <laughs> and eight-year-old Mila sent us her drawing of an underwater ride-on motorized dolphin. And then there was nine-year-old Connor, who wanted a button in the back seat of the car that you could press, and it would raise the seats out the roof of the car to make those long, boring car journeys a little bit more exciting. <laughs> Now, as well as being an engineer and a designer, I'm also dyslexic, but not in the way that most people think of dyslexia. My dyslexia doesn't affect my reading and writing, and I rarely muddle my letters or my words. For me, my dyslexia affects my memory. I forget things. So if one of you was to give me a list of five things and to ask me 10 minutes later what they were, I'd be lucky if I remembered three of those things at best. I find it really hard to take on board information and to hold that in my head, particularly in the short term. But up until the age of 15, I was pretty much a straight A student, or close enough. But after my GCSEs, I found that the amount of information I had to remember and regurgitate in exams had increased dramatically, and my brain struggled to keep up. I felt like a 90s computer struggling to run sort of 2008 software. I was drowning in information. And when it came to my A-levels, I revised stupidly hard to try and remember as much information as possible. But when it came to some of my exams, I just sat there with my head in my hands, and I couldn't remember anything. I felt useless. But the bizarre thing was, in coursework and written work, where I had Google or textbooks, I was in my element, and I was, cons I was still consistently acing my grades. But when it came to remembering long lists of information, be that mathematical formulas or just facts and statistics, I couldn't do it. My brain just doesn't work that way. So I ended up doing what many dyslexic people do. I focused on the things that I recognized I was good at, which in my case, I realized I was quite good at designing things, making things, and solving problems. And I became a little bit like one of those stereotypical geeky kids in movies who spend all their time in the science lab or the drama department, except in my case, it was my school's design and technology building. And I did an A-level in design and technology, and we had to design and build something and document the process. And I decided from the outset that I wanted to create something completely new, something that no one had ever made before. And I got a little bit carried away and ended up building this. It's a road-legal, solar-powered electric trike. And <laughs> The challenge I set myself was to create a vehicle that had as little environmental impact as possible. So I built a frame out of bamboo and loads of recycled locally sourced bike components, and I lashed the whole lot together with hemp fiber, and I got some sponsors to provide batteries and solar panels and a motor. And the project ended up being completely above and beyond anything I needed to be doing for school. But it became a little bit of an obsession for me. And ultimately, it was one that paid off, because I got the chance to go to the National Engineering Competition, this event in Manchester, where I was one of 150 young engineers with projects from across the UK. And I was lucky enough to make it into the final five in the National Engineering Competition. We went into this Dragon's Den style sort of celebrity judging event. And I somehow found myself winning the overall competition and becoming the 2010 UK Young Engineer of the Year. And suddenly, It didn't actually matter that I'd screwed up loads of exams and that I didn't actually have the grades I needed to go and study engineering at university. I got into uni on the back of the extra stuff I'd done because I realized that my brain worked differently to the way I was being assessed in school. I couldn't remember things, but I could invent things. And I've come to realize that my dyslexia significantly helps me to do that.
A couple of years ago, I started working with an organization called Dyslexia Cornwall. They're a local charity who raise awareness of dyslexia and who offers support for dyslexic people. They trained me up as a dyslexia advisor to go into organizations and businesses and to deliver workshops to help those organizations better support dyslexic people. Over 10% of the UK population are dyslexic. And from these workshops, I came to realize just how vital it is that we support and accommodate dyslexic people, but also those with other specific learning differences, like ADHD and autism. Recent links between, uh, between dyslexia and variations in the cells in our eyes have been made. But in broader terms, dyslexia has been linked to genetically inherited neurological differences, or in simpler terms, differences in the brain that are often passed between parents and their kids. One particular gene that's been linked to the presence of dyslexia is the KIAA0319 gene. And variations in this genetic material have been linked to the information processing challenges that many dyslexic people encounter. Now, these include the classic dyslexic traits that people typically think of, difficulties with reading, writing and spelling, and muddling of letters. But there's also a whole host of other ways that dyslexia can affect people that more often than not, people aren't aware of. Now, I've mentioned how, in my case, dyslexia can affect my memory. But for others, it can affect their organizational skills, with some finding it hard to work with dates and times, or finding that time seems to consistently slip away from them. Others can experience challenges with sequencing tasks, so working with um, dates, of, uh, sorry, dates or months of the year or letters of the alphabet. Others can experience challenges with directional ability, so telling left from right, or, or indeed right from left. Others can experience challenges around numeracy tasks, solving maths problems. Now, these traits that we give the name dyslexia to, these behavioral traits, they've been linked to functional and structural differences in the brains of dyslexic individuals. Functional differences are differences in the way the brain processes signals, and structural differences are physical observable differences that can be seen through neuroscience. But it's not just dyslexic people who have these functional and structural differences. In fact, if every one of you in the audience today were to get your brain scanned in a functional MRI machine, we would find that you all have observable differences in the way your brains function. And the term that's increasingly used for this phenomenon is neurodiversity. Among other things, neurodiversity suggests that dyslexia, autism, ADHD, and other learning differences are all ultimately linked to observable differences in our brains. It also suggests that these differences have stood the test of time and continue to be a natural part of human diversity. We know from natural selection that organisms typically evolve over time to shed attributes that are non-advantageous and to hold on to traits that better enable them to survive and reproduce. And it's been widely suggested, therefore, that dyslexia and other learning differences ultimately have stood the test of time. And they've done that because they've overcome and stood beyond natural selection. They're there because they're advantageous. Now, there have been consistent observable strengths, consistent observable things that are useful to people with dyslexia. One notable study in the US found that 35% of entrepreneurs identified themselves as dyslexic. Dyslexic people often have strong visual, creative, and problem-solving skills and are prominent among engineers, inventors, and architects as well as in the arts and entertainment world. But it's not just dyslexic people who have these strengths when it comes to innovation and creativity. Those with ADHD can experience periods of high, spontaneous idea generation, as well as energy and impulsivity. And some individuals with autism can be less prone to taking things at face value and better able to see past the emotional bias or the packaging associated with a problem to look past those things, to look at a solution. And in general terms, these neurodiverse traits can be really useful when it comes to solving problems and coming up with new ideas. Now, this link between neurodiversity and innovation is something I see consistently in both my engineering design work and through the kids' invention ideas we get sent for Kids Invent Stuff. Some of the most inventive individuals I encounter have dyslexia or some form of other specific learning difference. And more often than not, these individuals have struggled with traditional education in some way. 
In the UK, we're currently pretty rubbish at recognizing and acknowledging the benefits of neurodiversity and learning differences. Although it is widely accepted that a diverse society is useful when it comes to innovative thinking, but when we talk about diversity, we usually use the term in relation to race, gender, religion, sexuality, or age. We often overlook the natural differences in our brains and actually the varied voices, perspectives, and experience that those differences can bring. And we currently, despite a, a lot of research and knowledge around the benefits of recognizing and supporting learning differences in education, we currently have an education system that assesses the majority of kids' ability on the basis of their literacy skills and their memory. And our current and recent governments have actively, actively pushed for more rigorous formal assessments and less practical work and coursework, which in my own case, had these changes been present during my own time in school, would have meant that many of those practical, creative tasks that enable me to thrive may never have happened. And if that had been the case, then almost certainly I wouldn't be stood here speaking to you today. So I worry a great deal about the way we assess young people's abilities in school. We're currently failing those young people who experience challenges with literacy and memory. We're alienating them and persecuting them when we should be supporting them. In addition to that, the reduction in funding for creative subjects such as art and design technology also acts to alienate and persecute those young people. In the UK, there is an overrepresentation of dyslexic people in unemployment and in our prisons and young offenders institutes. In fact, in some UK prisons, over 50% of inmates have dyslexia, compared to 10% of the general population. So why is this? Well, research in this area has looked at what's called the route to offending. This starts with young people in school feeling as though their true abilities aren't recognized or acknowledged. In some cases, this can lead to resentment and problems with authority. Those young people come out of school, they need to put food on the table and pay the bills. But if you've been assessed predominantly on the basis of your reading writing ability and how much you can remember in an exam, and actually your skills lie elsewhere, is it surprising that many neurodiverse young people end up unemployed and struggling to find work, or that in some cases they end up turning to less legitimate ways of making money? So I feel very strongly that we need to better embrace neurodiversity in education. We are currently failing those young people who end up unemployed and in prison, when we should be empowering them to recognize the differences in their brains and to develop in ways that are consistent with those differences. It's our collective responsibility to ensure that young people in schools can learn in ways that embrace and support their creativity and their neurodiversity. Because if we don't, then we're going to miss out on many of the innovators, problem solvers, and inventors that we need in our ever-changing world. And if a child like Lucy can design a superhero suit that fires custard <laughs> at the age of seven, imagine what she could be doing when she's 27. Thank you for listening.